but nevertheless Yes. So these students, they went to the office, right? And they got the reaction from the ones who are, you know, the, the regular colony and how they actually want want to keep everybody out. Yes. Right? And they built the door to the gate, right? Yeah. That is the kind of condition that we saw. See, the advantage is... Yeah. Just think about it seriously. But I'm talking a few more serious things. So I'm not a sociologist, but I read a little bit. Uh, because of this interaction and working close by, and the less educated you are, you can find, if I'm a nuclear scientist, I can't find a job in Delhi. But if I'm a carpenter, I can find a job in my neighborhood. So poor people should live all over the city because they'll be close to work. Rich people, don't worry about them. They'll find, look after themselves. But poor people should be live, allowed to live everywhere in the city because then they don't have to travel. You don't have to give them public transport. They can walk in cycle, two, three, four, five kilometers because that's the same as rich people spend in the car. Secondly, because they develop human relationships with their employers, many of them, you give them old televisions, clothes, car, what do you call, quilts and so on, fans and so on when you don't need them. And therefore the lifestyle goes up. This has been recorded. So poor people's life improves because of help from their employers in kind. Secondly, because they're not spending so much time outside the home. If you believe in, in marriage, some people don't, but if you believe in marriage, the institution of marriage, then the husband-wife relationship is slightly better. It's not easy anyway, but it's slightly better. Thirdly, adults spend more time with their children, so there's more control. So these have to do with land use planning. Un not planning, sorry, understanding it. So this is uh, household size is 2.3. We have five. And cool. number of trips by all modes of transport in this most successful city by TOD in the US is 13%, 12%. In Delhi is 30%. So, Please look at your own data. That's all I'm trying to say. Don't believe formulae from outside. Believe the theory. It's very important to understand the theory. High density is correct. But what is high density? Is 15 high density or 100 high density? <coughs> and this is just to show you that all the successful cities in the world which have good public transport use have densities between 50 and 100. All our cities are much more than 100. Therefore, no matter which road you put public transport, you don't have to plan it. It'll get used because it's at high density. This is just, we had a very interesting conference a few years ago where we called a group called five representatives of Crime Prevention Through Environmental Design, CPTED. It's all over the world except India. Large number of architect, architects belong to CPD, CPTED groups. And they're saying that just by design, and you can reduce crime, improve public transport use on how you design your streets. And they're saying the first thing is the street must be safe from crime and accidents. The wider streets you have, you'll have more crime and more accidents. Because if you have a very wide road and a woman is getting bothered across the road, how do I help her? Then we put big fences and medians in the middle. So even a policeman is standing here, he can't get to you. He has to go in his car two kilometers to make a U-turn. By then, the woman is gone and the criminal is gone. Only in India and a few other idiotic countries do we have medians in the city and high fences. No American policeman or European policeman will allow you to make a fence in an urban city, urban road. 
because they, you see in all the your know, thrillers, all policemen make U-turns and chase the criminals. They can't do that here. So even if I want to be a nice Indian, as a male, I can't help a female across the road because it's so wide and blocked. So crime is to do with your design. So this is the only road where we try to do all, put, all, put all this into practice for the BRT in Delhi, and I won't go into that just now. And guess who destroyed it? Mr. Kejriwal, no. There are other reasons. Rich people didn't do anything. It's a, my suspicion is, yes, rich people is the people who own equipment to make metros. Because no newspapers are bribed, so don't forget that. There's no newspaper which is not bribed. So there is so much invested in capital equipment for tunneling and other things to make metros that if buses became possible, what would all the contractors do with that equipment? So everyone was bribed. And Mr. Kejriwal, because he's an IIT graduate, became income tax officer, so I have no respect for him. He destroyed the BRT physically. It's the only city in the world which has done that. Please remember that. So there has to be special about it, something about Indians. So this is what we are copying. And Phil Goodwin, who is one of the brightest transport planners in the US, said that solving congestion, it was also the axiom that resulted in grievous mistake like the destruction of the heart of some of our city centers to make room for urban motorways. I argue that solving congestion does not depend on building more roads, but we do our children no favors if we confine them to car dependent mobility. And I think our grandchildren will wonder what took us so long to understand this. He said this 20 years ago. And we are doing this after 20 years. And Mr. Gad why is Mr. Gadkari doing it? I say this in public. Because he's the richest man. The more roads you build, the richer you become. It's the fastest way of becoming rich. And more pollution. More land destroyed, more land used by children. So this is CPTED. So your homes should be such that people from their living rooms or balconies can see what's happening on the street. Because then the potential criminals know that someone may be watching them. Not CCTV cameras. Because this is immediate. OK? By the way, there's what is called a systematic review of CCTV cameras around the world, which shows that nowhere in the world have CCTV cameras reduced crime except in parking lots. They help in sometimes in catching the criminal after the crime, but they have not reduced crime. But it makes a lot of money for Israel and other people. So this is, these are the new urban designs, narrow streets, so you can s everyone can see what's happening on the road. Glass, front of, of homes being glass, so you can see. All shop windows glass, so that people inside can see what is happening on the sidewalk. So potential criminals know that they are being watched. Automatically crime reduces, and we have enough evidence of this. Studies have been done that when opaque fronts have been changed with transparent in shops, crime reduces automatically. This I've already mentioned to you. <laughs> this study, we did a detailed study in the US that when you have the supermarkets, 6.6% increase in crashes, 4% increase in injuries. So what population size maybe is the specific? I can see the families in. It's only because car use increases. That's the only reason. Because when people have to go a long distance to buy things, they use cars and motorcycles. This is, I'll finish with this. I've taken too much time. I hope, can we stay for 15 minutes? OK. So this is, I must, this is, maybe people, some of you may know this already. The Indian city, every district capital of India was established by the British. So every district capital, including Delhi or Gurgaon, 
the British ship kept before the after before 1857, before the British formally took over rule, there was an old city. Okay, which is high density. Usually not more than three kilometers in diameter because that's how much you take to walk in half an hour, one hour. So city size depends on speed of travel. And so before the tram, cities were generally not more than three, four, five kilometers in diameter. With the tram, they became seven, eight, nine, ten kilometers. With the car and metro, they became 40 kilometers, 100 kilometers. And so when the British made, after 1857, they did not, they wanted to be protected from the natives. So they built in what I would call an apartheid city, which is always called the civil lines or cantonment. There are very few civilized cities in the world. We have army living inside the city. And in most of our cities, district capitals, we have the police lines or army or other occupying at least 20, 30% of the land. So that makes land use very difficult for public transport and so on. Because the bus can go for long distances without any, through a containment, without any, without any passengers. And so anyway, so this is the containment, the British city. In Delhi, they also had a buffer city of their clerks, which was Karol Bagh. So Karol Bagh was between Lithuanian Delhi and so they had their clerks living here so that if the natives want to attack, they had to go through the natives first. And then they, I mean, so they were so br bright, they made wide roads. They made wide roads so that tanks could go on them yeah, and the army. And they made their boundary homes a long distance behind the boundary wall so that the, those days rifle bullet could not go through the window. So large lawns were to protect whites from Indians in the next battle. So this, this colonial city was an apartheid city only for whites and employees of whites. No one else could live there except the local talukdar and the raja and so on because they would give them gifts. Other people could not buy land there. After independence, the brown whites took it over and they didn't let other people buy land easily there. So all of your parents, most of your parents who were not government servants, all or children of talukdars and rajas could only buy land here, either honestly or through corruption. So we have three cities. And we must understand this about colonial, post-colonial countries. That our cities are not the same as European cities and American cities. So they're a little bit American cities because this is a white city and this is a black city. And this is the, and the railway line runs here in the middle. So, and South Africa. But Basically, we have to, that's why we have one center of business. In North India, it's a serious problem because too many Muslims live there. And so we neglect it. Yes. <laughs> so, so the British, because too many Muslims live there, the British neglected the old city. Please understand that for 100 years. That's why it looks horrible. In the meantime, because it's becoming horrible, the rich Hindus shifted out. So after the rich Hindus shifted out, they also neglected the old city. So the historical parts of all Indian cities are horrible. There's very few countries in the world where history was made and which is beautiful is completely neglected. That's why tourists don't come here. Who wants to go to, you just want to go in your taxi to, to Jama Masjid and come back as fast as possible or to the Red Fort. It's not a nice place. It's not like central London. Uh, so then our LG announced we are going to have congestion charging. You know, he also he used to be reasonably decent with Secretary of Urban Development, but something happens when you join BJP and become the lieutenant governor. 
he doesn't understand that this is the area of congestion charging in London. And this is London. It's a very small part of London. And guess what's there in part of this part of London? The most beautiful historical places. And therefore, and there's a pride of the city. So when you have congestion charging, no one shifts out. OK? All the operas, the theaters, the business offices, no one has shifted out. And it's only a small part of London. Even after congestion charging, what is the average speed? 15 kilometers an hour. Okay. Now, if you take Delhi, the same area will be that much. Will it make a difference? If you have congestion charging, all the businesses will shift out to Connaught Place. And Connaught Place will get destroyed. So we have to find other solutions. You can put it anywhere, Lajpat Nagar. If you put congestion charging, there'll be no shopping left in Lajpat Nagar. It's already happened. Have you understood that? In Delhi and Bombay, even Kolkata, large businesses have shifted out of the city because of our rules and regulations. So there is no tax space left in Delhi. Everyone has gone to all the businesses who have gone to Gurgaon, Greater Noida, Noida, et cetera, et cetera. So we must think about these things. If we want to have a tax space in the city, please don't do things which make people shift out. And this is mode of travel for London. Just notice, car is 37% today with the biggest metro system in the world. Number of people going by metro, 9%. Number of people going by rail, 10%. Bus, bus is more than rail and metro combined, about the same. So metro cannot be the answer. It's good for long distance travel. And Greater London, 30, 40% still go to work by car. Please look at the numbers. But our newspaper said London, Paris, <laughs> Tokyo, et cetera, et cetera. What is, after congestion charging, how much shift to public transport in central London, not rest of London, 8%. It's not a silver bullet. What are car use in India? London is 38%. 5, 6, 5, 11, 10, 11, 5, yeah, nowhere close. Motorcycles, yes. You can't remove motorcycles, except you have a dictatorship. Even then, it'll be difficult. Vietnam hasn't done it, has not been able to do it. Once you have motorcycles, and the West never experienced it, where 60% of 70% of your vehicles are motorcycles. Once 60, 70% are motorcycles, there is no political demand from the middle class for public transport. Okay? Please understand that. In Europe, as cities expanded, there were no motorcycles which were clean and less noisy and comfortable. Middle class could not buy cars mid 19th, 20th century. So there was a huge middle class political demand for public transport. There is no middle class demand for public transport and no middle class demand by women for public transport. So politicians are not being stupid. They're just being forced by foreign experts to say we'll buy 1,000 electric vehicles or whatever. But there is no demand, real demand. And poor people should not spend any money on public transport. Because if you're earning 10,000 rupees a month, you better spend all of that money in your children's schooling, food, and medicine, and et cetera, and housing. And not 2,000 rupees a month out of 10,000 on transport. It's better for poor people to walk and bicycle close by to work. Because if you make them spend on public transport, their children will suffer. They won't get their books, they won't get enough food, and they won't go to a good school, as long as they're privatized education. So if you want poor children to do well, they should walk, parents should be able to walk and bicycle to work. And what we can see from European cities is that just providing public transport doesn't reduce car use. What reduces car use is when people can walk 
and bicycle. If people can walk and bicycle safely, that's when private transport use goes down for two reasons. Because more people take short trips walking and cycling. Secondly, when walking and cycling become safer and nicer, then they use public transport also. Because you use public transport, you have to walk four times a day. From your place to the bus stand, metro stand, from metro to your office, office to metro, metro to your office. So you have to walk four times a day. So unless that's a nice experience, you won't use public transport. And everyone says, why to put the bus in the middle? There are very few idiots like Indians in the world. No other city in the world, there are about 200 cities now which have bus lanes and trams in the middle of the road. 200. Only in India has been challenged. Guess what, there's a picture from early 20th century. All the trams, including Delhi, Bombay, and Kolkata were in the middle of the roads. It's an old idea. Why does public transport have to be in the middle? Because then it doesn't have to battle with parked cars, entrances, exits. That's the smoothest place for public transport. And for you to reach the bus, you only have to cross two lanes. If, when public transport is on site, in the morning you may get on here, so you don't have to cross the road, but in the evening you have to get on the other side, then you have to cross the full road. So no, wherever you have it, you have to cross the full road twice in a day. So if you have it half, it's safer because you don't have to challenge the whole road. So deaths reduce in accidents. And uh, just I'll finish with this. When people say we should be like Singapore and control car use by heavy taxes, guess who has more cars per capita? With all the controls, because they're rich. Singapore has more cars per capita than Delhi today. Uh, and I'll show you this, that, and this is again for you people, Sit, when we've done this study also for 20 Ameri 16 American cities, a city, suppose a city is this big, you can have 20 roads running this way, 20 roads running this way, very wide. In the same area, you can have 40 roads running this way and 40 roads running this way, but narrower roads. So you occupy the same space in the city, right? And this is what's happening here. These are <coughs> wide, big blocks, so these are wider roads. These are small blocks, so these are narrow roads. Same area. When you have small blocks, then it's closer to the road. And so you can take public transport or taxis or whatever more easily. And we now have enough data from everywhere in the world. Cities which are small blocks, more people walk, more people bicycle, and more people use public transport. And our data shows, this is, for example, I'll show you why. The distance between main roads in Delhi is this, in London is this. So people have to walk less to take public transport. So we have to understand that people respond, people's behavior is decided by your design, not by individuals. And so streets, now this is a perfect street. We don't like it, but look at the activity. There is more business per square meter in this street in any Indian city than Connaught Place. There's more business transacted per square meter on this road than Connaught Place. It's safe, it's social, you meet friends. When you have a wide road, you don't meet anyone. And lastly, this is what I was talking about this is our typical road, and here is a lady standing there, and she screams for help. I'm standing on this side, what do I do? This is a design. Okay? This is in front of IIT. Earlier we had more energetic students 10 years ago, or 15 years ago. Whenever they put up with the fence, they'd go at night and break it. Now our students are so stupid and, and, and so calm and peaceful that they've harmed themselves because there's a subway on this side. 
which gets locked at 11 o'clock because they think there's prosecution somewhere at night. So the police locks it up. So if you come back from movie and come to that bus IIT gate bus stand, how do you come to IIT? Sorry? <laughs> because IIT is here, this is your bus stand. How do you cross the road? Fantastic design for people. So energetic students jump over. Sometimes they get hit by motorcycles. Others have to go half a kilometer to cross from the junction. So then they, say, then they say people are being stupid jumping over the fence. If I was young, what will I do? I'll jump over the fence. So I'll, this is my last one. So Sorry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but this is when I gave a lecture for him okay. uh, for SNU. Okay. He says, don't mention BRT. <laughs> uh, this is the last one. So what, how do you judge a city? You have to ask one question. You ask a question, can my eight or nine year old daughter go to her friend's place alone at nine o'clock at night? Can my grandmother visit her friend half a kilometer away across the road any time of the day? If the answer to that, any question is no, then your design is horrible. It's only when those two questions get answered yes, then you're a successful designer. Don't depend on the police. That's the worst thing you can do. A civilized society should have no policemen. Only uncivilized societies have more and more policemen. So basically no gated community, no roads wider than 30 meters inside the city, except a few ceremonial avenues. Because no pedestrian light is more than 30 seconds. Old people walk 0.7, 0 0.8 0 meters per second. So you can't cross a road which is more than 24 meters wide. 24 meters is maximum six lanes. Usually all roads in the city should be four lanes. Main avenue, six lanes. City blocks, no gated communities. Gate, gated communities increase crime, reduce walking, cycling, etc. Mixed use neighborhoods, which is happening anyway. And we must have spaces, I don't have time, but you must have street hawkers on every major road. Because the only thing which makes a road safe for women in India are hawkers. Because hawkers are permanent. And you are too young to have seen old Hindi movies with Devanand and Raj Kapoor and Dilip Kumar. When there were police officers in the movie, guess who were their favorite informers for criminals? They were street hawkers and beggars. Because beggars and street hawkers stay in the same place for years. They know everyone. You can ask a street hawker near my house, Ki Dinesh Mon ka ghar ka hai, he said, par aajkal Europe gaye hai. So Panwala knows, because everyone talks, the drivers talk, the servants talk, and so on and so forth. So, and the, all police, you ask any serious, honest police officer, who are your informants? All hawkers are informants. They are free secret service people. Because they, whenever something happens, they you know, note it down, because all policemen and all municipal people come for their hafta. So they have a very close relationship all street hawkers and beggars are very well known to the authorities, local authorities. That's how when we had our meeting, therefore yesterday, and 150 of us gathered in a small square near Jantar Mancha, within two minutes the police car was there. Because the fellow sitting across selling, selling beer, he must have phoned the police fellow. So, and they're very good because, they, for example, when you make petrol pumps, Petrol pumps have ice cream soda and they're much more now. 
because their car must have a place for petrol every kilometer or two kilometers and for repairs. So if you are walking, you also need energy. So you, you must have mumphali and chaat and uh, cold drinks at a similar proportion of speed. So you must have hawkers every 300, 400 meters. And they provide safety. They give employment. The government cannot give jobs. The private sector cannot give jobs. The only way your city will be safe is to let honest people earn a living through their own enterprise. Please don't seal things. Don't evict people. And they're doing a fantastic job of selling you stuff cheap. Guess who objects to footpaths being ob obstructed by hawkers? Do you know that? Car owners. Permanent pedestrians have never objected to hawkers. In Bandra, when they re removed hawkers, vegetable sellers in Bombay seven, eight years ago, guess what happened? The housewives went in a protest march <laughs> because they couldn't go no nearby to buy vegetables at a low rate. So you can design, and I won't, I'll end with this, you can, you can spend some time on this, how to design roads with spaces for hawkers. Not officially, just leave the space there. Because if it is official, then Mr. Ambani will buy all of them and rent it to people. Let them occupy it illegally. But leave a nice space with water supply, place for garbage, et cetera, et cetera. And because on every footpath, you have to have a tree line, right? If you have a tree line, you have to leave one meter of a dead space between trees. So you can landscape it so that hawkers sit in between trees where people don't walk, and so on. So these are our solutions. These are not our problems. Uh, thank you very much. I've taken 15 minutes more. <laughs> Sorry, half an hour more. <laughs> yes, I've taken too long, so there may not be any questions. I've been thinking about this very, it's a very important issue and question also. I've been thinking about it for a long time. And the only thing I can say is that India, because of its caste system, does not respect knowledge as a society. And 80% of the people are kept out of the system. The people who have a fire in their belly, which is the bottom 80%, can't use that fire. Others are too comfortable. They have everything they want. They seceded from India. They live in gated colonies. They buy bottled water. They have their own air purifier. They have children, their children abroad. So they don't, you don't have to have good universities in India, and so on and so forth. And we have neglected the public sector for 20 years now, 30 years actually, because of Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. And we Indians are very good at swallowing stuff and going overboard. Sorry? No, 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 just, just a minute. What I'm saying is that if we were intelligent people, we wouldn't swallow Margaret Thatcher. Because we hadn't reached that stage of a geriatric society and overblown pensions and this, that, or the other. We were still growing. But you know what is the 
in the US today, the total number of people, the proportion of people employed in the public sector today in, Europe, in the USA, which includes public school, I mean, government schools and everything else, municipalities, is 17% of all workers. In European countries, it's more than 25% of all workers work for some kind of government. What is it in India? Three percent. So only three percent of jobs are held by people who work for the government. So there are no professionals in the government. My cousin, who graduated first from, what's the place in Ahmedabad? Sept. Sept. Top of his class 20 years ago, 25 years ago, got a scholarship to go to MIT. Graduated, do his master's, graduated from the class there. Guess what his ambition was? To join the Boston municipality. And he's worked there for the last 20, 25 years in the Boston And he's one of the most respected fellows in the city now. How many of you would like to join Delhi municipality? See, to think about it seriously. Or Sonipat municipality. So what I'm trying to say, no, I'm answering your question. That unless we have a pressure to have respectable jobs where you can work as a professional in the public sector. Who can carry out your decision or, or take your data, number one? Number two, we have too few institutions in the country where work is done properly. So my, any, all of us around the country of in 30, 20, 30 good centers, including all subjects, is too few. We say in Delhi alone, if I put out this data, 80% of mem faculty members at SPA will oppose it. 80% of people in Central Road Research Institute will oppose it. Or 90. Or 90, and so on. So but then what happens is, if I'm the Secretary of Government of India, or a minister, Mr. Gadkari, should I listen to IIT, TRIP, or 33 uh, other groups in Delhi who are saying the opposite? So the TOD policy has been made by all the professionals in Delhi combined. So if the majority of professionals <coughs> believe the opposite, and there's no one in the government who can analyze it. So it's, it'll be a longer, so I depend on the people sitting around you, that as you people become more responsible, our hope is in you. We have failed. And I really don't care because I wouldn't be there after 10 years. I really don't care if the, the world disappears. But if you people care, you have to take some of these things seriously because we have failed. Because they weren't enough. And I'm saying, not, we, I shouldn't say we have failed. We have not been as effective as we would have liked to be. After all, many good things are happening. And they're happening because many of us did, did them. And, 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 and the, uh, some of our students are doing it. And some of our students have become faculty members, including Girish. So, uh, this is my phone, sorry. I think that's, my short answer is we have to have more uh, collegiates who think similarly. Because after all, a politician, my experience in my life has been that when a new idea has to be implemented, it can only be done by a good politician. And every time a good idea has been implemented in India, it's been by a good politician along with a good bureaucrat, not by professionals. Professionals have been my enemy up to now. So the, the whole, the, that's the most interesting part of innovative ideas. How many of you, all of you must have driven through villages. Have you seen those uh, water pumps which are uh, trapeziums? Have you seen them? Have you ever thought anything about that water pump? Hand pump? You know that hand pump is one of the most innovative inventions to come out in the world, technically. And Kanan, who worked on that along with his friends to make that water pump work for 20 years to perfect it. And it's been exported to up to Vietnam and South Africa, uh, African countries. Does anyone talk about it? That's why I observed people think that it's a lot about India starting having this kind of water production in the end of the industry. Yeah, that's true. Also. But what I'm saying is, my suspicion is that you wouldn't have been taught about it. 
that we had a fantastic, how was that water pump, what innovation, what work, what went into it to make it work. It's been one of the most successful technical innovations in India in the last 100 years. Because it doesn't break down easily. When it breaks down, the local mystery in the village can fix it, and so on. Mother Dairy, Mr. What's his name? Korean. It, some of the innovations he did are first class, never done in the world before. Transporting milk in non air conditioned tankers. Before that, all tankers transporting milk in the West were chilled. They calculated how long does it take for bacteria to reach a certain level? How many times does the tanker have to be washed to reduce the bacteria level in the tanker? So when you fill it with milk, when you fill it with milk, what is the bacteria level in the milk? You reduce it to that level. You have less bacteria in the tanker when it's filled. After that, what distance can it go before the bacteria level rise above a certain level? So they could transport milk long dist longer distances without air conditioning. Now, what, what I'm trying to say is, fantastic things have happened in our nation, and people have done them. But we must learn from them, we must talk about them to have pride, and not on doing head surgery in ancient India. And not in, and not in watering my garden with my urine, which is the latest. Maybe it's possible, but how can a minister say I've done it, therefore it must be good? <laughs> yes. Anyway, so, so all of you have a response. All I'm saying is, please think that we have really great stuff going around on the country. And if any of you had been, to the festival in Delhi on Saturday and Sunday at the Red Fort with 200 artists. Unbelievable, the level of, uh, of, 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 of uh, talent. Thousand students there on Saturday night, uh, sorry, Sunday night. No, all I'm saying is, sitting in our enclaves, we think nothing is happening. Some of those performers, Sheila from Bombay, I mean, I couldn't believe that there couldn't be that many performers in the world like her. So, this is what gives you, sorry, I'm talking to, it gives you pride, man. It, it makes you feel good that we can do things. And if these people are doing it all over the country, you don't know what's happening. <laughs> Just remember that also. And therefore, it's a great country in the sense that no matter what some people would try to do, other things come up and happen. But we need more of it. And we need more thinking. And don't go into these innovate centers of innovation. Centers of, you know, can an app, can an app make a better shoe? Can an app cut your hair? Can a cap shave you? I mean, just, Yes, of course apps should be made, but there's something more than apps. Can an app make a cheaper shirt? Can an app make you walk on a road which, which is not filled with water coming to Jindal? So, what I'm saying is, we must have more pride and Jindal being such an important university, it can't make sure that road doesn't look like a hellhole. Anyone coming here thinks what a horrible place I'm going to. I mean, we don't have any pride. The, some of the most important families in the world, in the country are sitting here, and you can't make a, have a road repaired. I'm being very frank, man. The fourth time I've come here, every time I say, I don't believe I'm going to a good university. <laughs> Think about it. Why? Suppose all of you, 7,000 students, went and stood on the road and blocked all traffic. <laughs> we are not going to go until this road is repaired. Think about it. They won't invite me here again, but think about it. <laughs> but so, you can make that difference. It's your duty. 
because the poor people, they can't do this, they're beaten up by the police. Police won't have the guts to beat you people. Don't stand there on a Sunday. Ask your parents to give you a gate pass. <laughs> so, so thanks very much. Sorry for keeping you so long.